Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. We're going to look at 48 things in the Old Testament that probably are the most important chapters in the whole Bible as far as the Old Testament is concerned. You know, for every physical action in the Bible, there was a spiritual reason behind it. There is a, there is a, and the, everything that Christ did, the Antichrist tried to uh, complicate, uh, come up with an evil side. And uh, it's like the old saying, the yin and the yang, the dark and the light, or come see, come sigh. For if there's one, the other's always present. And that's a fact. No matter where you go, what you do, if there's light, there's usually darkness present around it. If there's darkness, usually you can flick a light on and change that darkness, and the darkness will flee. So we're looking for the light of these 48 chapters in the Old Testament. There are 929 chapters. Uh, the following 48 chapters are the ones that we're going to select and dig out for the historical, the prophetical, and the theological, the practical and scientific, and then get the spiritual side of each one of these. We may not have time in this excerpt to do the spiritual side. And if we don't, we'll leave it alone until another time. But we, the first thing we have in Genesis 1 was the creation of all things. God spoke into existence all things. And that was it. And then we had the fall of man. So we had, we had this perfect world with a perfect man. And then the fall of man in chapter 3. In chapter 6, we had the universal flood. And this is in Genesis. Now these are things, if you're going to be a Bible studier, and you're going to go ahead and look to get you a degree of some kind, these are things you need to be able to take a test on and answer these questions and where they are. And say, I know where that is. And we have the Tower of Babel. That's in chapter 11. So here we are. We went from one creation. Now we're going to a, a, a great rebellion against God and against mankind at the Tower of Babel. And then we had the call of Abraham. Now that's in a spiritual. This was a spiritual action. We saw that worldly action at the Tower of Babel, but then we see the call of Abraham. <coughs> Nobody had to teach those guys in Abraham's young childhood, his father and those guys, to worship evil, evil things, and they did. So Abraham is going to be called out to be separated. And then in chapter 15 tells us the conditions and the way that God was going to make a covenant with this man Abraham. And he's going to be called the Abrahamic covenant. Now the Abrahamic covenant is where Israel comes in a little later on. And he is going to be the first Israelite to go out and offer sacrifice and that's going to be a system that's brought in place. So let's look in Leviticus, the anointing of Aaron as the Israel's first high priest. Now, uh, some, a good bit of time passed <coughs> from Abraham's call to Aaron. And then we see in chapter 8. Uh, uh, excuse me, I should I skipped the call of Moses. I chipped Exodus, excuse me, chapter 3. Exodus was the call of Moses. And then in Exodus we had the Passover. Now the Passover is probably one of the most important things that you'll ever read in the Bible. <clears throat> this is where, when, when you remember, when uh, the uh, children of Israel were captive by the Egyptians. And Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. So there came a time when God said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill the firstborn of every child that doesn't kill a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost, on the lintel above and on the side of the doorpost. And they were to do that. And that was uh, where Moses was told them to do that. And that was called the great Passover. And all of the children of Israel that had that blood there, which pictured the cross, that was the spiritual side of the Old Testament action. 
the action was there, but the spiritual side is it pictured the cross and it pictured the blood of Christ coming in the future. Now, that's one of the things you need to know if you're going to be a Bible a per, a perfect. Not perfect, because nobody will ever get perfect. But if you're going to get as good as you can in the Bible, you need to learn the best you can and the best way you can to know it. And then we had the Red Sea crossing in chapter 14. We see another big spiritual act. And before God acts spiritually with these people, he acts physically with them. Physically, he had told them to borrow all the gold and all the jewelry and all of the things that they could borrow from the Egyptian people. And then they had been slaves. They weren't stealing anything. They were owed what they borrowed. And they got all that gold and silver and all that stuff and the pots and pans and everything they needed and the clothes and the cloth and the, and the animals. And beside that, the Egyptians wanted them to take their animals in a big sense of the word. Egyptians didn't tend animals. To them, it was a curse. So here they left. Uh, they're leaving Egypt, and they come up to the Red Sea, this great barium. And there they, they quibble with Moses. And they say, oh, Moses, you have brought us down here just to get killed. The Egyptians are coming, and here's the sea on this side, Egyptians on that side, and they're just going to kill all of us. But God had a great spiritual awakening there. If you remember in that chapter, chapter 14, where they were, where uh, uh, the, the great wall of fire came down between the Egyptians and the Israelites and held them back until they crossed the sea. And that, that was some two million people, by the way. That wasn't a quick thing. It was probably a two-day crossing. And it wasn't just a quick thing. And those great walls of water were up there. And you remember that those great walls of water came down and drowned all the Egyptians. I can see God waiting until that first Egyptian hit the other shore. And here's the, the, all the way across the Red Sea, the Egyptian army. And then God dropped that water on them. And they're there. And by the way, that's been discovered today. We know it's a fact anyway because the Bible says it is. But uh, we know also that it's been discovered today. Chapter 16 the giving of the Sabbaths. Now, <clears throat> this was very, very important <clears throat> to the Israelite people that they had a holy day. And that was the Sabbath. And now the Sabbath didn't necessarily mean the holy day had to be on a certain day, even though there was a certain day that they did have Sabbaths on. But they had other things that they would do during the year that would be sabbaticals or Sabbaths during the year. The giving of the law. Now, the giving of the law in 20 was very important. And as the law came down from Moses, <clears throat> then we see the uh, instrument of the tabernacle being brought in and the completion of the tabernacle. Now, they had been working on it for a while in chapter 40, and here the tabernacle comes in. And then they have to put in the, uh, lay, the things that they had to put in there. In Leviticus, we see the anointing of Aaron. He was the first high priest. Who was Aaron? Aaron was Moses' brother. And Moses had used Aaron to speak for him to Pharaoh. Now we see that the feast days of Israel begin. What are the feast days? The feast days were days of appreciation. Days when Israel showed God that they appreciated what he was doing. Another thing this was, you and I today, as human beings, we take vitamins and we do things for our body. God knew that these people needed something <clears throat> for their bodies other than what they had. And God made sure. When God told them not to cut fish and meat on the same table, he didn't tell them that. Uh, 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 for no other reason except cleanliness. If you cut fish and meat, didn't wash the table and then cut meat on there, didn't wash the table and then cut fish and meat, didn't wash the table, what you got? You got disease and sickness. So God tells them they had to wash their hands. Why did they wash their hands? That was not necessarily a spiritual thing. It had been brought in and made into a spiritual thing, but it really wasn't. It was cleanliness. It was something God said. Wash your hands before you touch food. 
And then he said, wash your table before you switch from one meat to another. And clean up and be clean. That's what the laban and all of the water was there for. That was not necessarily a holy thing that they had to do. Now, they, everybody's always took stuff and made uh, something holy out of it when it wasn't holy. But it is. It's kind of holy for you and I at our kitchen cabinet, our shelves in our place in our kitchen that we wash them and keep them clean. Or we're going to have the same problem children Israel had. We're going to have <laughs> diatomane poison. <clears throat> so, uh, let's get that out of the way. All right, the, the Feast of Israel. And then in Numbers, we see the rebellion of Korah. That's a very, very, very interesting story. You read it and see where we live today. See if we do not live today the same way when Moses came off the mountain and God had given him, he shined like a light, and God had given the command. There was a group called Korah's group. And, and, and Moses said, hey, Choose what side you're going to stand on. The chorus group said, we're going to stand over here. And they stood over there. And they separated themselves from Moses' people, which were God's people, who chose to follow Moses. And God opened the ground and swallowed them in the ground, said, took them into hell whole, alive. They didn't even die. They went into hell alive. The, the, the earth opened up and took them in alive. That's a picture of hell if we ever had one. That's in chapter 14. Now 21 is a chapter where we see the spiritual side of the thing is is a brass uh, uh, instrument stuck in the ground, a serpent made on brass for them to look at. This was a picture of us looking at Jesus Christ and going through Jesus Christ to be saved. Now these were people that had already been bit by a snake. He said, those of you that have been bit by a snake, you look at that brass serpent and you won't die. And so these were people that had already been bit and they didn't die And that when they looked at that brass serpent. Now we come to Deuteronomy and we're going to look at one chapter there, 28. Israel had a future predicted by Moses in chapter 28. Now Moses said, if you will follow God, if you will do what God has told me to tell you for you to do, God will guide you, he will lead you, he will take you through, and you will have a, a good spiritual life. And we saw that in Joshua. Uh, they're going into the promised land in Joshua. In, in, uh, in the book of Joshua, now they're entering the promised land. Well, you remember when they first got there, they sent 12 spies in. And do you know that out of those 12, 10 come back with an adverse reaction. And you know that's about like the church today. You can line 12 people up and say, we've got this spiritual thing that has got to be done. It has got to be done. And you're going to have to sacrifice <clears throat> all of this of your life and this of your life and this of your life and we'll just put a, a timeline in here for one month. You're not going to be able to go to work for one month. Wow. Everybody would have an adverse reaction to that. Would there be two people that would say, I will do that and I will depend on God to give me a better job when I get fired, if I get fired. And I'll do that. For four weeks, I will go and do this thing for four weeks. It's going to take four weeks. That'd be like a four-week mission trip from uh, the, the United States to Africa. It's going to take you four weeks to go do that trip and come back. Can you find two men out of 12 that would do that? Would leave everything behind for that month and go? You, that's like them sending those 12 spies over there. There were two. Joshua and Caleb came back. And Joshua and Caleb said, Hey, them giants ain't nothing for God. Do you know... Do you know that, that God could drove every single one of them giants out of there with, with one drove of bees? He could have took one drove of them African bees, them killer bees, and flew in there and, whew, and drove them all out of there. I believe that's what he did uh, in one of the places later on in life where, they, where those two uh, guys go in there and find the table set and nobody there. Now let's look at this little lady, Ruth. 
Ruth is a picture, and Boaz is a picture of God, and Ruth is a picture of Israel coming out of a foreign place, and then here God comes and says, I will take care of you. Boaz says to Ruth, you're going to be mine. I would, you will be wined and dined and treated right. And so that's a picture of Israel and God. Then we got 1 Samuel. Now we notice the anointing of Saul as Israel's first king. Was Saul a perfect man? Absolutely not. Saul was a man that God had chosen, but Saul was a human being. And Saul had many, many failures. And we cannot condemn him for one. Because if we look in the mirror, we got the same failures he had on he had him in, in a big political state where they were seen by everybody. But they're seen by God when you and I have them too. Just as much as they were in Saul's life. Now Saul anointed David. He was anointing David because God said that God chose David. Saul didn't choose David. God chose David through the priest and sent David over there and Saul anointed him because that was God's deal for him. Second Samuel, Jerusalem becomes the capital of Israel. We just had something happen in the United States of America a couple of weeks ago. Our president said that he wanted to recognize the, the uh, city of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Wow. God said that all the way back in 2 Samuel, that it was the capital of Israel. And now we're getting <clears throat> so many people against Israel that a man had to stand up for Israel and say, Israel and, and it, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. Amen, hallelujah, and praise the Lord. That's the beginning. And, and we see, we can see the handwriting on the wall. We are down at the door where God's going to come on the scene. and He's going to shake this earth. <coughs> and He's going to shake it from in that part of the country. And this part of the country over here is going to get the fallout from it. And then we see the giving of the Davidic covenant. This is a covenant God made with David concerning the house of the Lord, concerning the house of God, concerning the way of salvation, concerning the plan of salvation. And from the throne of David was going to come the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He was going to come through that line of people and did come through that line of people. You say, well, Brother Peter, You've preached and said and taught. He came from God from the beginning. He was in the beginning with God. When the earth was spoken into existence, Jesus is the one that did the talking. God said, let us make man in our own image to his son, Jesus. And Jesus spoke man in his own image. And then Jesus did the talking. And then Jesus came down as a, an embryo into, into the Mary and became a flesh. I took on a fleshly body. I made lower than the angels on, by choice and came down and now went back to the Father and is standing in a fleshly body beside the Father. The first begotten of human beings to go after living on this earth and stand with the Father. The first begotten <clears throat> in, in the sense here. Now remember he was and, and did take the Old Testament saints uh, and the transition from paradise to the Father and put them up there and set them up there. But he was the first then of the risen from the dead. <clears throat> and he is the first risen from the dead. Now, uh, 2 Samuel, Jerusalem becomes the capital of Israel, the giving of the Davidic covenant. <clears throat> we see that. Now, First Kings, we see the dedication of the temple that Solomon built. Now, you remember, David wanted to build the temple, but God wouldn't let him because he had uh, done so many uh, things that were, in a big sense of the word, heinous, and some of them 
opposite to what God would have had him do. And uh, so he was, in a sense of the word, set aside from being able to do that because of the blood he had shed. He was a warrior also. So uh, the, the temple had to be built by his son, Solomon. So we see that coming up. Uh, and Saul was anointed uh, the first, Israel's first king. And he anointed David. And then in, we see in 2 Samuel, Jerusalem becomes the capital of Israel, the giving of the Davidic covenant, and then the first king, the dedication of the temple by Solomon. Uh, and this was a, a divided kingdom of Israel. This divided the kingdom of Israel from the rest of the world. It set them apart. This was another division. Uh, every one of these chapters have a, has a division in it back up in the top where it, when Moses came off the mountain, remember Korah decided he was going to divide. And you see what happened to him. Well, all the same thing, all the way through the children of Israel's life, those things happened. When they divided from Israel, they were uh, outcast uh, from Israel. In chapter 17, 2 Kings chapter 17, the capture of the northern kingdom by Assyria. Now, you mean that God allowed the Assyrians to come down and capture Israelite people, Jewish people? Yes. Why? Because of their disobedience to follow the system that God made. You and I today have a system God made. It's called a church. We go to that church. When do we go to that church? and an appointed time for the church in our neighborhood. In the neighborhood I live in, we have an appointed time, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we have a visitation on a Tuesday night, we have a visitation Thursday night, we have a prayer meetings in, the, in the, as many of the mornings, we have special prayer meetings during the week. As much of that stuff as you can attend, you need to attend, be attending it, whatever's in your church as much as you need to attend, attend it. If you don't, you can come under the uh, place of having to be chastened for it. If God speaks to you to attend it. And chapter 19 of 2 Kings is uh, the saving of Jerusalem by the death angel. Wow. Remember, we spoke over there about the death angel coming and saved Jerusalem. Now in verse 20, chapter 24 the capture of the southern kingdom by Babylon wow uh, and now we see the northern kingdom was captured by Assyria and now we see the southern kingdom captured by Babylon what happened both of these kingdoms had wicked kings uh, Israel had very few kings that weren't wicked and that's another whole study we won't get into that right now Ezra, let's get to the book of Ezra. The decree of Cyrus and the return to Jerusalem. Now in the book of Ezra, uh, that is a book that God used, a little bitty book that God used to return some people to Jerusalem. And then we see the, the uh, confrontation between God and Satan in Job. Uh, also in Job 2, we see that actually that, that Satan had a, a conversation with God, had a discussion, said to God, God said to Satan, if you considered my servant Job, God allowed Satan to take on Job and take on Job's righteousness to see if it would fail. And it didn't. Job came through. What did Job go through? Job went through a lot. A lot of people say, why would God allow a man to do that? Well, let me tell you something. Job had ten children, and after he went through this tribulation, and he got him a, a good wife, and he had ten more children, and he's got twenty children in heaven now, instead of ten. And so, that's the way that thing worked. And it worked out for the good. 
even though it was troubled times. And we don't know what Job's going to be in heaven, but Job's going to be a great, great, great man in heaven. We don't know what kind of orator he is going to be in the new world. Not the thousand year reign now. The thousand year reign is this earth being used for a thousand years after the great tribulation. But then there's going to be, a, uh, this earth is going to be cast in to the lake of fire. And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Now that new heaven and that new earth, there's going to be a realm there of people. We are going to be involved in that. How and how and what is God going to do? I have no idea. Neither do you. None of us really have any idea. But we know this for a fact. That we know all of these people are going to have the reward for the type of life they lived. And they're going to be kings and priests. They're going to have crowns. Many, Some of them many crowns. Some few crowns. There's going to be people with one crown. There's going to be people with... Uh, seven crowns, that's five crowns we know for a fact uh, in heaven. <clears throat> and they're going to be are on this new earth. And they're going to be rulers of some kind. And they're going to be used of God. And they're going to be used of God in the present form we're in. In a bodily form with a, with a life that will not die. With an eternal life. Where there will be no sin. Sin brought death. Uh, Ab uh, uh, Adam was created to not die. He was created that his body remade itself every seven years. All he had to do was not have any sin in it, and it would have been perfect. It would have been casting off the old body, building a new body every seven years. He's got a new body. And it didn't get old. It just continued, continued, continued. Look at Methuselah. He had a, a picture of that body living 900 and something years. And uh, so uh, we see that we can see that God had uh, made a decree for that. Now we look at in, in Ezra, we see the decree of Cyrus and the return to Jerusalem. Job, we saw the uh, uh, confrontation between God and Satan in Job chapter 2. Now in Psalms, so let's look at these. We're not going to look at many of them. We're only going to look at four of them out of all of them there is. Psalm 22 is the psalm of Calvary. This is the spiritual psalm of all of the psalms. This is the psalm of Calvary. Uh, psalm 23 is that psalm that God leaves for you and I as the shepherd telling us exactly how life is going to be for us. <coughs> if we'll follow the book, life is going to be as that good shepherd life. And then we're going to see the great confession of sin in chapter 51. That's a chapter 51, the great confession of sin. That's one you and I have had to go through. We had to go through the confession of sin to get where God could use us. And after that, then we see the psalm of the Word of God. Psalm 119. 119 takes you through the Bible. Psalm 119 gives you the breakdown that I'm giving you right now, gives you the breakdown of the whole Bible from beginning to end, 119. And then we, we come to Isaiah. Now Isaiah's prophecy tells us of the virgin birth. God gave Isaiah something that he didn't give everybody else. He gave him something special. Now Isaiah was a bald-headed man, we understand. How do we understand it? By what the Bible says. That wasn't very well liked by most people, and he surely wasn't liked by young people. And he had some incidences in there. As you study Isaiah, you will see in his prophecy. In four, chapter 14, we see the uh, t speaking of the fall of Satan, where Satan is going to end up, where he's going to be bound and cast in forever and ever. Well, originally he's going to be in hell until the, until the end of the thousand year reign after the millennium and then he's going to go on. And we see uh, the millennium reign and then we see in Psalm 53 the whole picture of the cross, the suffering of Jesus Christ. And Psalm 53 is the telling of, I mean Isaiah 53 is the telling of the whole picture of the cross. Who's going to put him on the cross? 
where they're going to put him on the cross, how they're going to put him on the cross, why they're going to put him on the cross, why he's going to go to the cross. And all of that is given to us all the way back a couple thousand years before it happens. Uh, 700, 800 years maybe before it happens, somewhere in that line. Uh, so we see Jeremiah, we see that promise of the new covenant to Israel in Jeremiah 31, that new covenant to Israel. Ezekiel is a departure of the glory cloud from Israel. Now remember, for a couple hundred years here, God has had a cloud over Israel. He put it over them when they got in the desert, over them when they got in the Sinai desert, he put that cloud over them by day so that they would not burn up in the sun. I've been over there. The sun over there will burn you up. You have to get out of it sometime during the day and siesta or do something, but you can't stay in it constantly. It will kill you. So, God put the cloud over Israel, and then he removed that cloud in chapter 10 of Ezekiel. <clears throat> and he also had a pillar of fire that went at night to keep him warm. Now you can see if you've been 140 degrees during the day and it goes down to 40 or 42 degrees at night, that's like going into a freezer and you would freeze to death. So you had to have, what did you have for firewood? What did you have to burn over there in the desert? There's no trees in the desert. They had fire burning continually. Continually, continually, continually they had fire burning. They had to use all of their waste for fire. They had to use a dry uh, animal dung. They had to use the human dung. They had to use uh, the old hides that were taken from animals that were sacrificed and, and, and burn them out there and dry them out there and do things so they could use them for fire. They had to have fire burning all the time. It took fire burning to cook the food. It took fire burning to keep the altar going. It, it took a huge group of priest helpers of the Levitical tribe to gather up what they could gather up that would burn to keep the fires burning day and night for 24 hours a day for a couple hundred years. Now, let's look at, at Ezekiel. The way we do, that's where we are. Then we see the dry bone vision. That's the restoration of Israel. That's God showing a picture of Israel coming back together one day. All those bones of all those saved people are going to come out of the ground at the rapture and go on to heaven. We see the future of the Russian invasion into Palestine. And we see also that in Ezekiel chapter 39. We see... In chapter 40 of Ezekiel, we see there is going to be a temple in the millennium reign. There's going to be a temple. In the thousand year reign, there's going to be a temple. You say, well, Jesus came now. We don't need it. We're not going to be the ones to do it. It's going to be that group that's on the earth from that day that come out of that great tribulation. There's going to be a group. Come out of it. There's going to be 144,000 Jewish boys that have never known a woman and they're going to be virgins, and they're going to come out of Israel, and they're going to come in to the millennial reign. Now, how is all that going to work? I do not know, but God does, and that's all that's important. <clears throat> and that they're going to be the ones that have that millennial temple. Then we come to the book of Daniel, the dream of the future Gentile world powers, Daniel chapter 7, the vision of the 70 weeks. We are in that great vision right now. We are down to the toes that are made with iron and clay. Iron and clay. That's the world system is the clay and the iron is the uh, a part of the, the thing that is going to stand but it's all got to crumble when you mix the clay with it. And then when we know that when we came to the book of Jonah that we saw the great fish. And we know that Jesus was in the height of the earth for three days and three nights as Jonah was in the belly of the whale. Perhaps the only reason, and it's possibility, the only reason Jonah was in the whale for three days and three nights that Jesus had it happen so that he could use, 
use it for a vision that people could actually see. We're so dumbfounded that people are, and they say, how could a man be three days and three nights neither and come back? Well, Jonah was. Well, God, Jesus walked through the earth. He set captives free. That's those that were in paradise. And he walked through hell and preached to hell. We saw that great fish. Now, Zechariah, the last book, the second coming of Christ. Talking about the second coming of Christ in the book of Zechariah. And you and I live, <clears throat> and we, we practice the Bible today from the first coming of Christ. We look back into the Old Testament as the prophecy and the forerunning of Christ. We see the battle from Genesis 1-1 with the devil all the way to Revelations and, uh, 22 and uh, 21 and 22. And so we see that battle going on and it's going to end there. Well, this has been a good day because it's been a godly day. If it hadn't been a godly day, it wouldn't have been a good day. So if you want a good day, you make it a godly day tomorrow. And, and for every day from now on, you make it a godly day, and you'll have a good day in spite of the circumstances. We'll see you next time. Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word.